Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Full Time Hustler. Today's guest is someone who's not just challenging the status quo, but completely rethinking how we approach some of the biggest issues of our time, especially when it comes to health, freedom, and alternative paths to personal well being. Let me introduce you to Charles D. Froman, a man with a truly unique blend of experiences. Imagine this a libertarian yogi who managed to get Forbes magazine to feature his innovative upgrade to health insurance, combining the best of health savings accounts and health sharing. And that's just the beginning. Charles lobbies for the National Health Federation, which happens to be the world's oldest health freedom organization. Since 2018, he's also been co-hosting Freedom Hub, an incredible podcast that showcases entrepreneurs and advocates who are actively building a better world. But what's really fascinating is Charles' journey. With a BA from the College of William and Mary and a Master of Education from George Washington University, he's worked with members of Congress, lobbied for financial trade associations, and served as Associate Director of Government Affairs at the Cato Institute. He even helped Whole Foods CEO John Mackey start Conscious Capitalism and ran the nonprofit that supported Governor Gary Johnson's two presidential campaigns. And if all of that wasn't impressive enough, Charles is also a devoted family man, living with his wife and two children in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's clear that Charles has an incredible wealth of knowledge and experience, and I'm so excited to dive into all of that today. Charles, welcome to the show. Before we jump in and into all the great work you've been doing lately, I'd love for you to introduce you know, your, in yourself in your own words. What's your story and how did you first find your passion for health, freedom, and advocacy? Well, Jason, thanks for that question. And I could say ditto to your intro, which kind of says it all. Um, but yeah, you can always reword things. And first, let me tell folks how I met Jason, if that helps at all. Uh, when I was working on that nonprofit, Our America Initiative, as well as helping with the grassroots for the presidential campaign of Governor Gary Johnson. Uh, I met Jason at one of those events in politics in Virginia, and I was impressed by his combination of being a veteran of uh, the Marines, I guess, and having this interesting gig of helping startups. Uh, and that to me is so important in today's chaotic age. I love the title of your podcast, Hustler. Um, because I think that's kind of what I've done in my life. And I would say a lot of folks who are, are trying to survive and thrive in today's age also are hustling. You, you see it in the gig work, digital nomads, side jobs, uh, losing your cubicle in the corporation, uh, the chaos of COVID. Um, but, you know, I had a, a pretty um, privileged upbringing, I would say, relatively speaking. Uh, you know, my family lived the American dream. Um, you know, if you saw Dustin Hoffman in the movie Finding Neverland, he played Charles Froman, one of my great uncles or great, great uncles, part of a group of families that kind of professionalized Broadway at the, at the turn of the century. Uh, Charles Froman brought Peter Pan over from England. But there's a big disconnect from 100 years ago and that experience and my experience. Um, the Fromans that I come from didn't really live in New York. They came from Sandusky, Ohio. They were into the paper packaging business and did pretty well. Um, and then I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, um, went to um, school. We moved to Virginia, uh, private school, a tennis team, band, academic bowl, went to William & Mary. And that's the place I went to. It's a good school, but I got up in four years barely because I was having too much of a good time. Um, and I was just losing my focus and my purpose. And I became a waiter at the colonial taverns there in Williamsburg that people go to as tourists. And because I was a government major at college, just because it was easy, learning how to cram and bullshit, you know, read and write. Um, I decided to go to D.C. with a friend to find a job, and I farmed my resume out with congressional offices, not having a clue how I was going to get hired. Did temp work, filing notes at Freddie Mac, whatever I could get, just to pay the bills in you know a large uh, you know group a group apartments with a bunch of other buddies. So it was it was um, efficient living, budget driven driven living, barely living. That's fine, um, but I got hired. 
1991 by a Republican. I was so clueless on politics, I had to ask my dad what party I should go for because I was just really focused on having a good time um, and just uh, hustling, you know, just to get pay my bills and, you know, find friends uh, like a lot of young 20 year old type men in, in cities uh, with ambition. And so I got hired by a Republican and uh, I was dumped the health care issue by an older legislative assistant just when bill clinton got elected and hillary tried to socialize the healthcare system by as my later cato colleague uh, doug bando pithily said uh hiring uh, insurance companies to take care of it to manage care and then capping it with medicare price controls so boxing it in and paying someone else to deal with the headaches and that was hillary care that's basically basically what obamacare became 20 years later um but you know, um, I guess I discovered that I was a curious kind of person and not one to just accept whatever authority figures told me was the truth about this or that issue. So I got to meet a lot of avant-garde lobbyists and, and scholars, and I learned about the opposite of government top-down healthcare. I learned about personalized empowerment, specifically uh, health savings accounts. And then, because I was having such a good time still, I had to clean up my life and I got into yoga um, after a while. I was just working out and stuff. And but I got into natural uh, healthy eating um, and I realized that that wasn't really what the lobbyists with the money were trying to get us to support in Congress. And then I got hired in a, tr in, in a trade association in the financial sector, mortgage brokers, then title insurers, then federal credit unions. Uh, so I got to see both the the, um, the congressional world from the aspect of a staffer uh, filtering information from lobbyists to my politician boss, and then I became a lobbyist trying to get things done. Um, and so healthcare kind of took the side uh, was was put aside for a while as I focused on financial uh, matters, and then I was becoming libertarian too for my disillusionment with Congress and how it basically was a cesspool for the powerful. Um, so I was becoming healthy, uh, becoming libertarian, learn, learning about personal empowerment in all kinds of markets. Um, then I got hired by the Cato Institute, the libertarian think tank uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. Uh, at the same time, I became a certified teacher of Kundalini Yoga. So I was meditating intensely. So that made me a better person, more neutral able to deal with stress much better, but I was also dealing with scholars and congressional offices with these big issues. And then I found myself on my own having several small nonprofits as clients, getting gig work. Um, and not all of my job switches were my choice, but you know, I found it pretty cool that I was able to get hired uh, without too much challenge, uh, which made which made me happy that I didn't have to panic. Um, but then I was able to find about four or five small nonprofits to give me a healthy monthly gig income with great clients in natural healthcare, pain medicine, uh, consumer choice healthcare, and then uh, other things, uh, uh, other matters. That I had a security guard client actually that was run by some of the yogis. <laughs> who practiced the same, the same yoga as I did. Uh, so that was a, a different angle. Um, but then I, um, you know, I got married um, and that I left I left uh, lobbying to become a teacher. I got my master's. Uh, I, I, I had always wanted to teach. And uh, so I taught in DC's inner city at a charter school, not as rough as a big box school, but rough enough, same father free kids smaller classrooms, um, you know, you learn from these chaotic experiences. You learn how to adapt to chaos and get through it, earn your paycheck, not get dumped, try and help some of the kids learn, although most of them didn't. Um, and then I, um, through helping John Mackey at Whole Foods, I had helped his conscious capitalist organization, it was called Flow. Back in 2005, I was recruiting attendees for his board meeting at his ranch outside Austin, Texas. So I got a few big wigs there. And for some reason, um, 
I had Gary Johnson, the New Mexico, New Mexico governor, on my mind, and I got him to come, except he canceled last minute because he fell out of the sky on one of his, one of his extreme athlete endeavors. He was paragliding, I think, and just fell into some trees, broke his back, almost died. Um, but I kept in touch with him uh, when I was out in New Mexico, where my security guard client was, and that's also where the center of Kundalini Yoga is <clears throat> in Espanola near Santa Fe. I visited Gary at his house in Taos. Uh, he gave me a tour. We spoke for a long time, and he kept in touch, uh, and I had pushed him to run for president. And he said that I was one of the reasons why he ran. Um, so I was brought into the campaign in 2012. And then 2016, he tried again. And at the second convention, I met a uh, health insurance alternative exhibiting at a booth. And they were selling something called sharing, which I'd never heard about. I, I got my license to sell it because I wanted to diversify my income. I didn't like being reliant on government affairs work. Um, so now I had two income streams, which was nice, uh, the nonprofit and now commission sales on an Obamacare alternative. And I didn't know it at first, but as I got into selling it, I realized this is a game changer because uh, it wasn't insurance and it wasn't government. It was like a credit union, kind of like leaving a bank for a credit union. Without shareholders, they could drive profits back into, into member benefits. So they really gave uh, members a better experience. And I found that out later tangibly when my cousin, whom I had gotten onto a sharing plan, used it for his cancer and he died. So that's well over $100,000. And they held his hand during the um, difficult choices he had to make about what treatment to get. And um, so it, it wasn't adversarial, which is something people experienced with Obamacare, you know, health insurance. It's, it's very adversarial, getting, getting your claims paid and figure, figuring out if your doctor or anesthesiologist or hospital is even in network. So um, I've become pretty much, I guess to answer your question five minutes ago, uh, an expert uh, in health benefits. Uh, I mean, the good kind that'll make you into a cash patient, which is important to create a real market in healthcare, which lacks prices. And, um, you know, I found myself uh, getting back into lobbying with National Health Federation. So, you know, multiple income streams, uh, all collectively empowering the, the markets and thus helping people. So, so, and then also I'm still doing my yoga. So I'm in a good place. I love that, Charles. And you kind of highlighted this, but Forbes recently highlighted your third way for health protection. Can you walk us through how combining health sharing with health savings accounts works and why it's a better alternative than traditional insurance or government run options. Well, um, I cheated a little bit to get Forbes magazine to cover us because I knew the author. And the reason I knew the author is because it's John Goodman, the father of health savings accounts, who was educating us young congressional staffers back in the 1990s, what the heck to do in opposition to Hillary care. Uh, so it was scholars like John Goodman who were teaching us about what were then called medical savings accounts, self-insuring your first dollar through your low thousands dollar of expenses to keep the third party out of your life. And it made sense. It was educational. And um, when I heard John was going to write an article about Obamacare alternatives because the expense of Obamacare chased a million realtors out of the health insurance market because realtors and small businesses that are successful are too rich for a subsidy, which is uh, a rich subsidy that a lot of folks get if you get Obamacare on the exchange. If you're too rich, you can't get a subsidy. And if you're paying full freight on your own, you're paying basically a mortgage every month for health insurance, which is not sustainable. It's bankrupting. Luckily, Obamacare had an exemption for members of religious sharing ministries. So a lot of realtors, whether religious or not, were coming to Jesus and joining these religious sharing ministries that soon made so much money they were advertising on Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity. Um, and they worked great. Um, you know, sharing is like insurance in that you're paying a monthly fee and there's some group, some entity that's going to pay your hospitalization bills. There's differences in detail. There's no spread of risk, so it's not really officially insurance. Um, and 
So we were able to get compliance with Obamacare by another way, not the exemption for religious hearing ministries, but through adding a small insurance piece uh, that was structured in a way that offered what was minimally, minimally required for compliance and also structured in a way that allowed for a health savings account. And we are using now a non-religious sharing ministry because one of the ministries decided that this way of paying bills or sharing in medical bills uh, was so good that everyone deserves to have access to it, not just the religious. Uh, so Sedera was formed by Dr. Dale in Austin and then a knockoff Zion in Utah, which are now the two sharing uh, organizations used by brokerages like, like mine that have this minimal essential piece that allows for compliance and the health savings account. So John Goodman was all over that. Plus, it, plus it's available for businesses, not just individuals. So John Goodman loved that. It wasn't just because he knew me. He was writing an article and he was he genuinely thought that what we offered was a game changer. And it, and it is. We're, we're, because sharing is great. There's no networks. You know, Obamacare has networks. So if you get an anesthesiologist or surgeon on call is not part of the network, you're going to get you're going to go bankrupt being chased by bill collectors to pay your hospital bill. There's no escape unless you declare bankruptcy. Um, when you become a cash patient as a sharing member, there's no networks. You can go wherever you want worldwide. And as long as the bill is in English and U.S. dollars. But so uh, we're going to help you shop on cash prices. And then with the health savings account, now you have some funds for the out of pocket costs, including dental. And you're paying what two fifty three hundred dollars a month for the sharing, which is a great price. You know, add the family members, it's going to go up to five six hundred a month, which is still expensive, but it's more affordable than Obamacare minus the subsidy and the health savings account. Not only is a great uh, fund for out of pocket, like dental and urgent care and specialist visits and therapies and chronic conditions, but it actually, for sophisticated folks, is a tax shelter to build a hundred grand by retirement. So a lot of folks will get the health savings account and not use it because you can sock away up to seven grand in it annually, roll it over every year. And then whatever interest the bank pays into it is not taxed. You can invest the balances and that's tax-free investing and then legitimate withdrawals for health expenses are not taxed. So, so it has three tax benefits. You build a hundred grand for retirement. If you do have out-of-pocket liability that you're facing, if you want to go have braces, an elective surgery, you know you're going to have cavities, you want something for chiropractic, urgent care, um, ongoing therapies, chronic disease, we have a money doubling account that doubles your money over three years. That's actually better for out-of-pocket. So that's that's my niche. And now we're going to businesses, and it's a game changer. Republicans don't know about it. Um, they're defending insurance. Democrats don't know about it. They're defending Obamacare and maybe Medicare buy-in and Medicare for all. Um, a few million people are now insuring plans. It's growing exponentially. Uh, no one goes back to insurance once they leave for sharing because to do so would mean that you want to be limited who you can go see by a network. And no one wants a network once you learn what they are. And, and a health savings account is golden. Um, so, yeah, I love doing that. And then, of course, there's the lobbying for health freedom. So it's it's a nice balance. You mentioned you you started to mention the the money side of it. And I'd like to dive into that because health costs keep rising, and many Americans feel stuck between expensive insurance and government plans. So how does your model offer more freedom and affordability for individuals and families? Well, I mentioned the price, the average monthly price, two fifty three hundred dollars a head per month. That's a good price for most folks, especially if you're used to outrageous uh, monthly insurance premiums from Obamacare, if you're too rich for a subsidy. Admittedly, you know, the subsidies are so rich that, you know, even uh, low income folks or modest income folks might get a subsidy such that your Obamacare premium is very low, lower than, than what I can offer you. And I tell folks, you know, if you want to go to the exchange to get a subsidized plan, go for it if you need to save money. Uh, you know, there's no discounts for my plan. They're they're they're, they're flat. They're 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 solid. Two fifty to three hundred dollars a month, whether you're buying on your own or through a business, uh, keeps it simple. Our prices don't go up. We might have a, sm a small price increase come January, but they're relatively stable. 
because we do phase in pre-existing conditions. Um, and that's that's ethical. You know, the, the community wants to have these pre these monthly payments, these fees stable so they can budget. You, you keep that stable by telling a cancer patient, um, you can't join us after your cancer, just like you can't buy fire insurance for your home after your fire. You know, be responsible, get these plans before you're sick. Uh, and if you're sick, you know, we'll, we'll protect you, but it's gonna be a few years, no, nothing in the first year. We'll give you $25,000 for that pre, pre-ex condition in the second year, 50,000 in the third year, and maybe an annual cap of 125,000 every year thereafter. So we'll help you, but just not now because uh, we'll, we'll, we won't be able to we won't be able to exist with adverse selection if we take every cancer patient a month after their diagnosis. Um, and that's why we support government as a backstop. Obamacare is becoming a backstop, much like Medicare Advantage. You can join it any any time of the year. I mean, with special conditions, but open enrollment you can join uh, without any kind of wait on pre-ex. Uh, and then before, even before Obamacare, there were risk pools for the sick, for the uninsurable. Um, but for the healthy, they should be able to join a membership of, with people that are ethical and believe in healthy living. And that's what sharing memberships are. Um, and then we help you shop on price. Uh, we work with vendors who disgorge bundle pricing so that you could find a well-priced uh, surgeon, ambulatory surgical center for your um colonoscopy or your 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 hernia your knee operation uh you know there are outpatient facilities with surgeons that are better in quality and price and we're going to help you find them a hospital isn't the only place to go um and it's usually the worst place to go especially for tests um so we're helping create the cash market because once you join us we train you to identify yourself as a cash patient and to ask for a discount and you'll pay the first few thousand dollars your part of the bargain with your health savings account and anything above that the sharing community is going to share and make sure you're protected against uh, bankrupting costs so that's how it works what are the biggest misconceptions people have about health savings accounts and health sharing and how do you see those misconceptions evolving in the next few years well as advertised by uh uh, Rush Limbaugh and now Sean Hannity, people know about the big sharing companies, which are still religious, MediShare, Christian Sharing Ministries, Liberty. Um, and so the secular ones that our brokerage uh, works with are lesser known, but they're more known by the high quality benefits advisors on LinkedIn. And we won't sell the religious sharing ministries. We'll only sell, excuse me, Zion and Sidera as we package them together with uh, other vendors, whether it's for your medical medical records, for free uh, mental counseling, our concierge team is going to make it easy and hold your hand, help you shop for well-priced drugs, tests, and specialists. Um, but most folks still think of sharing companies as religions. Um, but that's going to change because the, the fastest growth is with the secular sharing organizations uh, that, you know, we're facilitating at our brokerage. Um, and then, you know, only, our, only we can work with businesses. And, and that's where the fastest growth is occurring in big companies. Big company employees will be getting sharing. And then those who can't afford the pre-existing condition phase in will maybe get sharing and Obamacare at the same time in case they have a catastrophic event in the first couple of years. They'll have Obamacare for that. And then after a couple of years, they'll ditch the Obamacare, keep the sharing because sharing has no networks. And a lot of folks want to have choices if they get cancer or heart disease. Um, but that's the biggest mis misconception about sharing as far as health savings accounts. The biggest misconception is what it is. Most people in corporations have gotten what's called a flexible spending account, an FSA, which is a use it or lose it account where mm -hmm. most of the workers are buying prescription sunglasses in December uh, or, they have to re or they have to return unspent funds back to their boss. Um, it's a cafeteria, it's actually 125 plan. They're popular. Most people have had them in big corporations. The health savings account, 30 million people have them. Um, they love them. You can build 100 grand by retirement. Um, you could use it to build to buy a boat when you're old or, or a vacation home uh, because the income tax penalty when you're old is very small. Um, and the um, penalty for non-health withdrawals ends at retirement. Um, now, health savings accounts can't be funded in retirement, 
and unless you get a special Medicare um, medical savings account plan, which isn't available in every state, um, it's a little different from an HSA. But um, Congress is trying to expand HSA so everyone everyone can have them because they're wonderful. I'd like to talk about your lobbying for health freedom. Um, as the lobbyist for the world's oldest health freedom organization, what have been your most significant wins so far in advancing health freedom? <clears throat> well, during COVID, uh, I admired Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Del Big Tree and the frontline COVID doctors. Uh, they had money and influence and connections, and they're doing great. Um, at the um, commissions at the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, they had they had advisory panels on whether to recommend or approve uh, COVID vaccination and the emergency authorization uh, extension of it to ever younger populations, including down to toddlers. Um, that's where most normal, normal people drew the line um, since COVID itself, whatever it was, and we can have that uh, discussion, uh, had a you know 99.999 percent survival rate, um, and we all know that those who died were old and already comorbid with other chronic diseases. In other words, no one healthy died from COVID. So why would you give healthy young people this shot, which has only uh, risk and no reward? Um, so while Del Bigtree and his friends were wonder wonderfully showing up at these advisory meetings and testifying against extending the emergency authorization for toddlers, I figured that we need to get the politicians involved. So my success was getting groups of congressmen to co-author a letter to FDA against approving this dangerous shot for toddlers. I got a couple dozen uh, politicians uh, on two letters, including um, senators and congressmen. And uh, my effort was covered in the Epoch Times and Substack by Robert Malone. Um, and then I did it again a third time, this time exploiting the chaos around, you should like this, Novak Djokovic being banned from the US Open tennis tournament because he was too smart to volunteer in the COVID vax experiment. Um, the powers that be didn't take kindly to the in independent thinking and, and voices of people like Novak and Aaron Rodgers and Kyrie Irving and, and all these other heroes who became heroes because they dared to think for themselves during the pandemic. But so what I th thought was, let's get another congressional letter, again, to force these politicians to get involved. You know, uh, the, a, an official letter co-signed by a bunch of politicians, you know, that's a serious thing. Um, and I had them uh, write to Biden to lift the unvaxxed visitor ban. Was I, was I successful in either um, effort? No, ultimately, but that wasn't my goal. I didn't think I was going to win. Um, you know, we're only now winning and probably won't really win until Trump wins and hires RFK to run his chronic disease commission. Uh, because if that happens, uh, Kennedy's going to tear a new asshole out of the bureaucracies, and all of them, FDA, CDC, FCC. We'll get into wireless, USDA. Etc. Um, I hope I can speak French on your podcast, but if not, Absolutely. I hope you can hope you can edit that out. Uh, but you know, so I just substacked actually about how the pigs, uh, my affectionate term for the cronies, are scrambling to pass what they can now in Congress, specifically with the wireless bill, which is what I want to get to because you know, the vaccine issue has kind of settled down for a bit. Uh, we defeated the COVID vax. Um, you know, and uh, you know, people are, are pr proud of that, and those, and I was involved with that. Um, but now I'm the main lobbyist against the wireless mesh, which has every bit uh, of danger as vaccines are uh, have, and about which people are learning. Um, you know, there's tens of thousands of studies more for wireless radiation danger than there were for lead, pesticides, and cigarettes. Um, and the science is settled with, with those. 
Uh, but just as with vaccine dangers, wireless danger, science has been smothered um, and defunded. It, it's been found to uh, cause cancer at the EPA back in the 80s. Uh, Long-term radiation exposure studies at EPA were defunded in 1996. FDA paid, paid $30 million to the National Toxicology Program to study the danger of cell phones. They found clear evidence of cancer. FDA ignored the study. FCC was just remanded a couple of years ago by the Federal Appeals Court for ignoring over 10,000 pages of scientific evidence of biological harm to humans and the environment. We're flying blind. We have whistleblower evidence from Swisscom um, and uh, another company uh, showing clear evidence of cancer. Industry knows the danger of this. We're not Luddites trying to make it inconvenient. Uh, I have a cell phone, but there's a safe way to communicate in the tech age. Um, when you're not using your cell phone, put it on airplane mode. If you're going to put it in your pocket, keep it in airplane mode or turn it off. You don't want this next to your ear. You don't want this in your pocket. I see you're reaching. Yeah. At yeah, night time, I've seen at it. Night, it. I know it's not. I'm doing it now. Yeah, yeah. This is serious business. A third of us are sensitive to radio frequency microwave radiation. A third, five percent seriously, some disabled. Yet Congress is about to pass bills to carpet our forests with antennas, 5G antennas, our farms, every existing tower with more antennas. Um and yet there is funding for fiber to the premises, which is what you want, either that or a cable. It's faster, safer, more reliable, and as a military guy, it's more secure. 5G is software easily hackable So uh, because it's, it works on nodes. Once you access one node, you have the whole system. Um, and, and all the top folks know it's insecure. Um, so what you want when it comes to Internet is when it comes to your home, you want to have a wire to your home, every home. You don't want to have them doing what they're doing now, which they want to wire to a tower and then have a series of small cell 5G antennas on every other street lamp and outside your school and throughout the downtown areas. Uh, you don't need that. All you need, all you need is a 4G tower nine miles away. A 4G broadcast nine miles. So you can zone it safely in the industrial zone on the hilltop in the rural area you don't need it next to your neighborhood you don't need a tower next to your school or your local park where you're going to go skateboard or hike okay so we're going to get the truth out the truth is coming up about vaccines and their impact on the real epidemic of chronic disease and the truth is going to come out that telecom is lying to us they stole our money with our phone bills, we all paid surcharges over the past decade. That surcharge was promised for that wired connection to everyone's home. Now, inside your home, your Wi-Fi turn it off at night. If you can um, consider uh, restoring Ethernet to your laptop with uh, adapters, even your cell phone, that's how you get really safe because it, it agitates your cells. So 5G is a millimeter pulse wave used by the Pentagon and weaponry act of denial to control crowds or to hurt diplomats in the Havana syndrome. So it's a weapon or by the fusion centers to torture dissidents or former mil former military NSA people who are whistleblowing. So you can have a balance with telecommunications. The towers have to be zoned where they need to be far from you. Your home needs to have a wire connection and you need to behave inside your house safely for you and your family. Wireless router goes off at night. The phone goes off at night or in airplane mode. And you put it in the room or out of your bedroom. You got to get a building biologist. Talk about which switches to turn off on your switch box at night to turn off the electri electricity from your bedroom. We have a Schumann residence, a natural frequency with Mother Earth. It, it, you learn about in yoga too through meditation. You have, and we all know about the hidden history. Uh, the lies that the government tells us we don't know what's going on with this earth and that gets the freedom hub and i could talk forever jason you better interrupt me if you have a question or i'll just keep talking um but um yeah so um you know changing health benefits to create cash patients to empower themselves 
uh, leading the health freedom charge uh, because all these toxins and pollutants are what's causing the real epidemic of, of chronic disease. Uh, then, you know, platforming leaders like yourself, I know you're coming on pretty soon, uh, to educate people to learn the truth because everything's a lie. You've mentioned you mentioned two very good and, and and I would interrupt, but it's just the content is so is so rich. It you've mentioned you know the, these vaccines, and you've also mentioned like the wireless mesh with telecom. So, in your experience, what is the most critical issue for health freedom right now, and and how are you an organization working to address it? Well, to answer that, let's consider Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Because if anything's going to happen about the complaints I'm about to itemize, it really would help for trump to win and to keep his promise to form a chronic disease commission that uh, is vetted by robert f kennedy to disgorge the corporate capture of the bureaucracies behind that epidemic so as kennedy eloquently says the chronic disease epidemic affecting half the country up from 10 percent in 1990 uh, is is a result of a synergistic attack of pollutants in our air, water, land, food, and medicine. Um, so it's hitting us at, from all angles. It's, it's the shit they're spraying in the sky. I'm sorry, I'm swearing. I shouldn't do that. Um, you know, it's, it's, they're spraying us like bugs from above. Um, they're irradiating, irradiating, irradiating us unnecessarily in order to have internet connections. Um, they're polluting our food with more toxins than you can even know about because they're so hidden and distorted by weird definitions like bioengineered or natural flavor um, and genetically modified uh, to resist weeds uh, when, when what we need is a, a return to organic farming. So I think the answer to your question is it is a synergistic effect. Uh, you know, the, the farm bill is a great example. I could even show my screen if you want. Um, Please. Um, let me just um, show this window here. Uh, get that, Nicholas. Let's see, allow. And are you seeing this? Yes. Um, okay, this is my NHF catch all um, defeat preemption. Let's see if this is the right one. Um, Okay, let me open this window. This is the correct one. Did not have that one open beforehand. So if I open the farm bill link that you could put in the notes for this recording, um, this one paragraph. Has everything in the farm bill, it's a sample email you can send. And it's up here, the farm bill. Let me highlight this. I like so, this. I like when when companies do this. By the way, this is a way that if a user came right here, there's a, like a a very tangible call to action. I really do like. I just want to compliment this site and how they frame this because, like, again, right here, go in, click if you want to do something about it. Email right now. I like this. Yeah, I got a bunch of these. Um, so there are some must pass bills in Congress right now. Uh, so I um I, I substack. Where's my Substack? Uh, right up here. Go to you like this. The pigs are scrambling before Trump wins. <laughs> um, because they are email on that, by the way, and I love it. And, and for the subscribers listening, you should subscribe because again, this is this is dropped in your email box. Yeah, um, the crony pigs are scrambling to pass stuff before. Congress adjourns, and one of the worst offenders is uh, this farm bill. Um, it's loaded with stuff. Um, it's going to block local organic requirements. Local governments require organic treatment for the local parks. Well, not so if this bill passes. Um, people are suing for glyphosate. Uh, on my weekly Freedom Hub podcast, uh, Morley Robbins talks about um glyphosate smothering of your cells as batteries and suppressing copper and he says copper is the missing link for health but you can't have copper intake for health if every food you eat is smothered in pesticides 
So it's a, it's a big deal. Um, genetic modification, you know, you should be shopping looking for that tag, no GMO project. You shouldn't be eating modified organisms. Um, and the Farm Bill is filled with subsidies for farmers to put transmitters and sensors and trackers on the farms. And it's already been blamed by court for killing 20% of a farmer's cows and depleting milk yield. Um, but I'll stop sharing. You know, that's just one example where, um, you know, it's a farm bill, there's a parks bill, a nice sounding bill to help our parks that has a provision to carpet our parks with 5G antennas, which are going to make parks uh, uninhabitable, uninhabitable, uninhabitable by the one third of Americans who already are sensitive to radio frequency microwave radiation. It's going to exacerbate a fire hazard uh, proven in several recent forest fires in California blamed on towers, lashing wires, uh, towers not kept up so they're overgrown with vegetation. Um, and, uh, and it's unneeded, you know, they have a reason for the bill, but, you know, we, we, we need to have our forests as places to escape digitalization. And if you are, you know, the justification for the provisions are emergency access. The problem with that uh, reason is that um, any modern cell phone now, wherever you are in America, can at least text 911. Most of the folks don't know that. Experienced hikers do, but that's a fact. So you don't need this bill to pass for a rescue if you're in trouble. Uh, in most areas, you can also call 911. But at the very least, you can text 911 wherever you are with this. Modern Androids as well. And experienced hikers and outdoor people know about gadgets you can buy as well um, for emergency reasons. Um, they want to make it easy for uh, forest service personnel to download Netflix or something. Why else would you want a mesh of uh, 5G towers all through the antennas? Um, and we don't have any safety studies of this stuff. I told you how it was suppressed at the EPA, FDA, and FCC. And as long as they're within the exposure guidelines from FCC now, which go back to 1996, that's the last time they were updated, you can't sue telecom for any kind of injury, just like you can't sue pharma for vaccine injuries. Um, so we have the worst so health freedom can't um, thrive or exist until we fix all these pollutants from our air, land, water, food, and medicine. It's a synergistic effect. So which is worse? The people in each area suffering will argue, argue it's theirs. You know, the 5G mesh is worse. Uh, the vaccines are the worst. The pesticides are the worst. Um, the geoengineering is the worst. They'll argue. Uh, it's all of the above, I think. Agreed. I can't help it as you're saying this, and 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 especially to think that Rand's like Fountainhead is is no longer fictional. Like it, we're we're across it. Like I think we may have crossed. I mean, she was a profound thinker in her time, and 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 it was recognized then, though an outlier, but nonetheless a thought leader. And yet now it's proving even more like almost prophetic. Like the Fountainhead is is especially in its arms and its reach. And again, they're going on data that we don't even that they don't even use and they're doing it again, always in the name of safety and, you know, safety. And as I, I love that you pointed out, we don't get anything added. Like there's no, there's no added safety. We can already text 911 and those that would be in the positions most likely know it. So it's like, there won't be an uptick in actual safety. So that always brings up the, the question of what's actually happening here, which, wow. You know, again, I, I got to go back and read a lot of uh, Friedman and Rand and, and I know it was nonfiction then, but it's becoming prophetic, you know, unfortunately. Well, I have a three minute warning I could play for you right now on video if you want that I had produced at Kennedy's Children's Health Defense. It's three minutes, three minutes long. If you want to include it Absolutely. here, I could. Hey, just, um, oh, yours. Uh, here it is. Let me, oh, let me share it first. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what it's all about. It's pretty scary. I think you'll like it um so entire screen that's such a thought leader like a like an academic or like libertarian lead in it's like this is fear mongering but you will like it in the sense because you'll get it and at least it's saying what you're trying to say i mean such i love that that'll pique a lot of people a certain audience's interest 
Yeah. Um, did I have to click sound for you to hear this first, by the way? I think it'll, I think it'll play. Will it, will it play? Is it, um, it's, has it, it got a lag? It's just lagging. Oh, well, let me stop it then. It's not going to stop sharing. Please include that link, though, because I'd like to I'd like to put it. And I also I use these just for reference. The reason I do transcripts, not because I go back and read these, but so that I can turn this into a blog and I can just generate the content. So it's like, please include that link because I will put that video in the article that I write. Yeah. And to summarize what I tried to show you, um, the scary implication of the wireless mesh and it's scary also from its potential synergy with the actual in ingredients in the COVID shot, by the way, and I've had several experts testify to that effect. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, it's scarier, it's scarier than what I'm about to say, but probably what's going on uh, is the global elitists that want us sick to become good pharma customers uh, and want to control us so that, um, you know, we, we become compliant uh, with the corporate smart system they want to have in the Great Reset is that when you have a mesh of, of wireless in your appliances, in your smart meters, in your TV, in your antennas as they get deployed outside your rights of way in the uh, street lights and outside your schools and offices and through the parks and the farms and the forests uh, is to A, monetize your data um and there's nothing inherently wrong with that i think people like it when we're, the world is made convenient for them but not at the expense of your health number one and number two the uh, the sinister aspect of behavioral control we know that communist china um subjects you to penalties for non-compliant behavior they give you a behavior score well how are they gonna uh, track you to score you it's through the wireless mesh um so, you know, just as we have with the vaccines, the science has been suppressed, the agencies have been captured by the crony corporations, um, and there's no informed consent. Um, people, hopefully, want their informed consent. They want to have choices. They want to have control. They want to have a flourishing world, and they want truth. And we need to have uh, a free flow of information, including um, harmful information. Uh, there was a conversation I watched yesterday with a free speech lawyer who said hate speech actually is important to protect because you need hateful speech to get to the truth. You need to, you need to debate it uh, so that in the in, in the forge you can uh, hammer out what the truth is. If you suppress discussion, it's just going to you know you know create a boiling point where folks are going to explode. Uh, you know if they're not given their right to freely express themselves you know i've mentioned that many times in in, in many different contexts of i can tell an ac or an intelligent person uh and 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 actually this data goes a little bit further and is actually more revealing because i actually started tracking this in um grad school it is indicative of grad school degree based off if a person if you can introduce a conflicting idea no matter how hateful or radical to their own, and they are able to debate without, because it, and and it, and it, it may seem marginal what I'm saying, but so many have an opinion on X, whatever. And I don't mean to give a plug there for former Twitter. I mean, X is, is, is anything. And yet when you debate, they will not move positions. And what I've noticed, those that can entertain, not just, not just move positions, but even the opposite side of that, the ability to entertain the other idea other than their own X is again, surprisingly in the, in my own little, and my don't extrapolate too far marginal results here. I meant very in my own firsthand research and, and in my research though, it is almost 80% also have a grad degree. So it was like, it was very indicative that, but it's like, and I'm using that again, before I got into that actual realization of tracking, even though again, it's 200 something participants, which is a very small study, but it's my own. And, it is intelligence. Again, that's why I use it at the high level. A person that could say, hey, 
you know, left opinion or right opinion or whatever, you know, because again, as a libertarian, I'm introducing, I'm trying to introduce an other opinion to both. I've noticed I use that as the sign of intelligence that if a person can at least hear what I'm saying, like, and, and not want to shoot me and blow me up instantly and like, and just melt and degrade. Um, and I'm loving, and I want to point out something else that you're pointing at. I love the distinction you're making and in a conversation as recent as today, uh, I had mentioned in, and I want to, be very specific here only in verbal communication with this person that I, I i have always grew up and i have a love for pickles in my i think at the cellular level my body thinks that pickles are god or equivalent because <laughs> when you know there's this thing they say that when were they whoever they are that when women are pregnant they crave something and my mother just happened to crave pickles not saying the causation or uh uh it is is but to this day, I, I, if you gave me a pound of sugar or a, whatever pickles, I, the, I would take the pickles 10 out of 10. And to me, the serving size of pickles is whatever container they come in. I bring it up because they've got a life. It's my longest addiction. And again, probably the cellular level, because when I was being formed in the womb, I was being formed off the you know, reprocessed pickles. Um, that I want to move from vinegar to fermented. Now, again, hot, the, really the only point of this kind of the that I'm making this is to say that the distinction is this was a verbal communication only today. I took a picture and I think I still have it of an ad being shown to me on Facebook. And it is, I don't know if my camera will pick it up, but it is vinegar versus fermented and it's a sponsored ad. Um, and it shows that it, and it's the very reasons why I was already open to this idea. Cause I've came across this material and other sources, but it's the same day showing a, and now again, this is verbal communication. And to this person I'm having a communication with, I, I, I picked a screenshotted the, and I think that's what you just saw the picture of the ad. And I'm like, this is illegal. And that, you know, we can say what we want about algorithms, but at least they listen. So I'm being sarcastic. I'm being satirically sarcastic here. And that like, I liked it. It listened, but at the same token, the way they got that data. And I know because this conversation has not been, I, you, you do a search for me and deep and dark web and you won't find any relative resources that associate me to pickles until i just said this now i'm at now i mean that and it's like they showed me an ad that day so obviously they're farming data that they're not supposed to get but at the same token kudos because you showed me an ad that i think is relevant and i love right here you're, you're you're going to the next level it's like and to my own admittance i didn't even mind that you hacked my data that because you're showing me something that i do like yet and even i'm a consciously aware that unofficially officially you've mined that data that wasn't data i shared on your network facebook you've mined that data by listening to my device and saying hey and then you went and sold an ad and i'm to the company that sponsored it you know they're blameless they don't know how I, you know the ads are working they don't care really. but the point is that facebook did put their ad in front of a person that is more likely to buy their pickles now where you're adding and i want to really for the listener to draw is that even though i'm okay with that and i'm not saying anyone has to be and I'm not saying that's right. I'm, I am noting that's illegal because like I didn't give that to you, Facebook. I think like, you're not supposed to be listening to my device. You should share data that I have on your network and I give to you. But this is something I had a private conversation phone in my pocket. You're saying that I do definitely 100 percent care at the expense of, of my health. And that is 100 percent absolute universal. Yes. Like, under even if I do like pickles and you're going to show me an ad, I don't want my health to depreciate in any way for any. The juice isn't worth the squeeze here, vinegar or fermented, <laughs> not to be, no, excuse the pun, but um, you're absolutely right. I, not at the expense of my health, period. That makes where the, so to speak, the, the metaphorical line has to be drawn. Yeah, um, people like convenience. And I think if corporations were honest, they would opt in for convenience um, or even appreciate the right to opt out if they don't want the convenience for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, uh, fraud is an important thing. Uh, and if they claim that, that there's no danger and they get their capture bureaucracies to say there's no danger, um, unless there's a thermal uh, heating uh, on your skin, which is how they judge danger now. Um, that's not what the science suggests. The science suggests the danger is what's called biological, not thermal. In other words, the uh, radiation is going to harm you over time without you feeling it until it's too late you're not going to feel heat or thermal so it's just so cynical that they 
are able to capture the process, the media, the politicians in such a way that they can lie and extend the lie for decades, suppress any pushback from safe technology advocates or health freedom advocates. Uh, and they're shooting themselves in the foot because we're going to want justice at some point um, for a lot of things. Uh, this is America. You know, uh, America means um, freedom and justice. You know, we want, like like Leonard Reed said in the 60s, uh, as libertarians, we want anything uh, allowed that's peaceful. But as Judge Napolitano and others say, we want justice if you harm somebody. You know, just don't hurt people. And we're, we're being run by these global elitists and oligarchs that run our government that are hurting us. And probably in an probably in a nefarious fashion and some folks don't want to go there but how can you not how can you not go there and i go there on my weekly freedom hub shows my most viewed shows are those that do discuss who they are i love that you're doing Eddie. you're confirming that for many years you know in meeting with libertarian a lot of times people don't know what libertarian is and 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 the way i've always couched it is you know it's we love freedom without saying but following but but i preface it with two things i say don't physically harm another that's law number one that's universal law number one universal law number two is don't take their stuff period and i love that you're getting definitely that first no physical harm and the reason i want a distinction on physical is because the left and i don't want to get into i've offended you i don't and i want to close the door on that i want to say no physical harm and don't take anyone's stuff it's it's stop and and as, that's it you don't have to go to Harvard Library and read. Speaking of uh, one of the, the friends that I'm, uh, um, will definitely send this podcast to is a is Harvard professor, uh, or no, excuse me, a professor at my alma mater, American from Harvard grad, undergrad, uh, um, uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton. So prestigious, you know, and studied pol political science and then government grad. And and I say all that at these Ivy League schools, and studied political science, and later now professor. Uh, studied one hour and their whole curriculum on libertarianism and i just want to say that's the see you really want to want to beat something up suppress it see you don't have to go you degrade it what you do is you suppress it the problem with censorship is dot, 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 they don't finish the set. that's the problem and and we have such a gap people like you and i i'm glad that you're doing this that you know your podcast um obviously the efforts of this one um, I do want to back up and ask one more question on health, but I do want to segment into your, your topics on, on Freedom Hub and, and your podcast. But this, this, I just want to summarize and make sure that the audience, because I'm using a term health freedom. And like, a, like I like to discuss, I have a lot of my close friends are attorneys. And the reason we get along is in our personal dialogue, we spend a lot of time on definitions. Um, in fact, I believe a good law, a good attorney if you read, I don't care if it's an 80 page paper they make or a hundred, the first 75% of it is let's get specific on what X and Y mean. Um, and you know, with a, with a passion in mathematics and computer science, it's like, I, I like the logic base of that. So it's like, I want to define and or let you define what I have been using as health freedom. Many people may not be fit, familiar with that term. So how would you define it in the context of your advocacy? And why should more Americans be paying attention to it? Well, health freedom is a catchphrase uh, that has grown over the past decade uh, uh, in, in advocacy via adv advocacy against vaccine mandates in the states. Um, and well, it's specific, it has, really, it's associated really specific to vaccines. But it, so to, to point out, it won't necessarily include like and you brought up other topics like the, the, the wire. It won't really bring in like telecom and like all these. It's really associated to the vaccine. Well, well let me finish. Um, it has grown um, mainly because of Robert F. Kennedy's advocacy at Children's, Children's Health Defense to include um, other uh, threats to our health, uh, okay. specifically those pollutants in the air, land, mm -hmm. water, food, and medicine. So mm -hmm. health freedom does include, um, you know, the radiation that they're um, forcing us to accept uh, on our houses against our against our informed consent um, with a spraying down on us, uh, you know, 
even though they hide it and gaslight us that we want to discuss it, what they what they're polluting in the water, what all, all the ingredients, the Franken food they're putting in these uh, pre-made boxes of food. So health freedom has expanded uh, from just uh, opposition to vaccine mandates uh, to having honesty uh, and, and being free from the corruption that harms us in these other areas. Uh, so, you know, you think of health freedom as a, as a circle. It, it, is, mm -hmm. it, it has expanded to include mm -hmm. all these uh, environmental toxic threats to the air, land, food, and water as well. And I would add um, health savings accounts and personal empowerment. Uh, and uh, for the doctors that are natural healers and being persecuted, persecuted by licensing boards and the FDA, their right uh, to practice medicine. So it, it has become a big tent. Good. Actually, I think that's the, in the age of information, I'm a firm believer and I, and I do have to credit, uh, I, it was Gary Vaynerchuk, I first heard this type thought, but I've, I've felt it and I agree with the sentiment and herein uh, that in the age of information, there is huge value, not necessarily in you being, in a, you know, he, he was speaking in the context of like startups and they, you know, you being the creator of something new. It is the creation in the sense that there's value in this age of information when there's vast information like vast topics and multivariable topics like health freedom to be the aggregate. So what I'm asking is if not just, is there references to an aggregate, but I would like to go to like your freedom hub. I would consider that one of the aggregates. If you want to learn about health freedom in its multivariable form, where are these aggregate platforms? And let's move to your podcast itself. Well, if I can, uh, share screen successfully this time <laughs> um here's our most viewed health freedom shows which will give you a good idea about what we're about uh, this is a noon eastern wednesday show we've hosted for seven years um every week except holidays and you'll notice some some themes there um uh opposition to the mandates uh, the vaccine mandates i mentioned which yes. is a fairly old issue uh, but also the corruption in the vaccines themselves. Um, we have a bill at my lobbying client to force the government to study the disease outcomes between the vaxxed and unvaxxed. And can the you government up, has see the name one more time. What? That? What's that? Just scroll up so I can see the name one more time. Just, just I want to write down to make sure I get this link. But I want to get you have your health and health biz and politics. Yeah, the, the the health biz, uh, the biz of the business of health and the politics of health. So health biz and politics. Um, so you know these are my most viewed shows. Uh, the top two on the left there were frontline doctors persecuted during COVID. Oh wow! The, the middle guy there, Mark Steele, I think is ex uh, intelligence, warning about the synergistic uh, death awaiting. Uh, humanity from the 5G's uh, being unleashed on the Vax uh, nanometals. Um, uh, uh, then we get into the problem with allopathic medicine here on the left, diabetes. Um, the mainstream prescriptions for diabetes and other heart issues and cancer are coming under scrutiny for having poor outcomes. And so integrated and natural alternative healers are starting to get more money and fame and respect as studies bear out the experience that they're having with their patients. Um, ICRA right there, I get into um, the benefit revolution of which I'm a part in serving sharing into larger companies. Um, a lot of uh, doctors becoming integrated, responding to consumer demand for more effective treatments when they go to the doctor. Um, so you know that's the trend. You like this one over vaccinated soldiers. Uh, it, it's it's uh, ungodly to me how they make soldiers into guinea pigs with no informed consent, suppressing the uh, evidence, and so many injured soldiers, which may be a partial cause of the of the post traumatic sy syndrome and all these chronic diseases uh, veterans have. Um, but that's my health show every Wednesday, and then on Thursdays. I, I push the envelope on appropriate content, Freedom Hub. Um, and the most viewed shows have criticized uh, our supposed allies um, making trouble in the Middle East, 
Um, of course, the COVID pandemic uh, tyranny, uh, and then several shows on who is controlling us. And we look at bans on free speech, on how to what extent we can criticize uh, certain tribes of people. Um, we have shows on the reality of our earth uh, or even on history. There's a lot, a lot of evidence that all of history is a lie. And we go there and people want to discuss these things. And let me stop sharing. Um, and you know that because those are the most viewed shows. It's kind of like Voltaire said, to know who controls us, think about who you can't criticize. I love that quote. It's very, it is, it, it, I've referenced it many times, thought of it, noodled it, and you're, you're exactly right. Speaking of your Freedom Hub podcast, what, what are your most or your favorite or most impactful but i think you're answering it because i think if you're if what i'm reading and please please correct me if i'm wrong but you're data driven in the sense that you're covering a wide array of topics and you're watching what's being viewed the most but again the question being what have been some of your favorite and most impactful conversations um well um let me just show it again um mm -hmm. and i'll just nail it down a bit more here um entire screen allow it's uh right here on the top left kevin barrett talked about the zionist threat to americans um i think people who think for themselves notice with uh trepidation that any discussion of the disproportionate rep representation of a certain tribe in the corridors of power in every market um, leads to deplatforming, uh, derision, and as I said earlier, uh, even hateful speech uh, is important for truth uh, because if you can't discuss things that are on your mind, um, you're going you're, you're to become a powder keg. And I don't want to dilute gonna... the topic here, but one I have always, where I became a believer of this sentiment was actually, and I can't remember his name, but the founder of the playboy uh competitor hustler he was all, he was a notorious character for always going against government um Her uh, flint uh flint and there was a movie done about him uh, uh woody harrelson played his character but in that in that especially in the movie but throughout the court cases that flint had which is really what i'm referencing not his, not his particular business uh, which was a raunchier version that's a loaded term but a raunchier version of playboy which tried to keep it classy if if whatever you take that to mean um, Flint multiple times in court and record. And the movie did cite this in one of the lines uh, Woody Harrelson comes back and says, you want to protect me because when it's, I am protecting you. What I can't say is the edge. If you demonize me, I am the edge. I'm where freedom stops. You know, freedom is not everybody saying the same thing and whatever that may be good, bad, but it's the outliers that you actually have to protect because that's the power of whatever the freedom is in this case, the speech or, and I, and we're living and notice it's an old issue. You know, we're, we're now framing it as like hate speech and let's censor it. And if you watch the last debate, there was a lot of errors and from a third perspective, but namely none of they, there was a general shared notion that the government should have a role in helping censor or fact checking as they're they're citing it but you see why does the government have to do is what i'm saying like why i should here's the here's the question of freedom and i say this as a marine and that fought for freedom do i have the right to lie then caveat emptor should just hold supreme and it you don't have to believe me i can tell you right now that i'm pink and that you know i'm the best looking podcast host you've ever seen i could say that that doesn't mean, Charles, you have to take that any further than what I just said. And you could put that in context of my my stretch there, my own description, or you could put it, I said something hateful. You can put any adverb in front and change what I edit me with, with deep fake. But the point is, that's where the freedom is. You should be able to say that. There is the, the freedom really is between every stimulus, and this is a quote I don't know where it referenced, but I believe it was science, scientists, and it wasn't in context of policy, but between a stimulus and a response is a pause. I can say whatever, that's the stimulus. And, but you hearing it, there's a gap between when I shut up 
and what you do with it. There's that pause. That's the power and that's the freedom. Now, the freedom extends to, am I allowed to even say that? And I'm, this is a scary time we live in because there's so much notion of government getting in in an active way on what people say. And again, it's, it's being framed specifically and largely around social media dialogue and what is the government's role necessarily or authority, which I should, I should say, and fact checking that, which is such a ludicrous term given the government, and it'd be very hard to have an entity stand up and say, who's the authoritarian on this issue? Who is the actual rightful heir to the truth? It's the, we're all full of liars. The, you, you don't have any credibility when it comes to actually being the fact checker, but I digress on that. But um, I'm glad that you're distinguishing that freedom. You have to, it's the people that say hateful things. That's the test. That's the acid test. Do we as a society say, we don't want to hear that big brother, please stop them. Or do we say that's hateful. Let me just keep scrolling or not do anything with it again. Ignore. That's my freedom. Their freedom is they still should be allowed to say it. When you start censoring words, that's a scary. There's so many science fiction writers and thought leaders and academics that it, the parallel is this dystopian future that it seems like we can't. We're jumped up, got in a hurry to get to. Um, and, it, you know, one of the telltale times is the censorship of what we say. Um, and I'm sorry for digressing there, but um, to get back to your theme, as someone who balances advocacy, and I think I'm asking this for my for myself, but as someone who does balance advocacy and content creation, how do you ensure that your podcast educates, engages, and empowers people to take action on the issues that matter? Well, <clears throat> let me address first, if you don't mind, what, what you just said about censorship and speech, because that's important yes. to uh, emphasize, I think. Uh, in a fantastic town hall a couple of days ago with Robert F. Kennedy on making America healthy again, uh, he did say that the courts have ruled that lies are included in protected speech. Um, and in another podcast, um, a free speech lawyer said, you know, hate speech is what you want to protect to get to the truth. And I think you saw this. I don't see how, how, how folks could have missed it. Um, Governor Newscom in California passed a law. I think his name is Governor Newscom. Um, correct, me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's pretty much Newscom uh, passed a law banning AI-driven campaign ads. And the reason he's doing that is because the wonderfully hilarious meme people out there, you got to find this, folks, made a, a Camelot. Uh, Kamala ad where she's saying the most ridiculous things and the court case you referenced from the 80s with the hustler guy Larry Flint and the uh, Woody Allen character uh, was a SCOTUS decision protecting um, you know the worst speech and if Governor Newscom sues uh, Elon for allowing that hilarious Kamala ad to stay on X I would think that it would be over. I, th I would think Governor Newscom's lawsuit would fail because the uh, Larry Flint decision has stood the test of time to protect bad speech under free speech because you don't need a free speech law for popular speech. You need it for unpopular speech. Um, and then to um, answer your question, um, also, I want to finish the Freedom Hub popular show themes. Um, true Earth and and his, his history, the lies of history, I think are the fastest growing topics that people want to know about. Um, they're they're the powers that be are are struggling to um, censor videos of NASA caught in lies. Um, there are no photos of Earth from space. Every photo from NASA is computer generated generated imaging. Um, and all the supposed live shots from the space station uh, or even the so supposed launches from SpaceX are all cut and edited videos. Um, and so people want to know the truth. 
Unrelated uh, to that, do you know one way you can backdoor that evidence is go on NASA's job site. Like they're hiring. Do you realize the amount of scientists or astronaut-like related fields that they hire compared to media-related? And that if someone would go just backdoor that, that re ask the question of does NASA hire whatever the science-related space travel, whatever the person looking may think that is. Jobs related to that, put that in the left category, jobs related to media. Start with that question. Just go look at their jobs and it is on USA Jobs and what they hire out. And it's amazing what you'll categorize in the left, which is damn near zero. And on the right, you're like this, it, it just looking at the answers to your own research to that question. This is just based off job search, which is not exactly much scientific evidence to prove the point here, but it, it would clear evidence when you do this search is this is a media company. Yeah, full of actors and, and fakery. And then you think about the fact that there is a treaty from the 1950s that can't be questioned until a couple of decades from now, forbidding independent uh investigations uh and travel to antarctica if you travel independently below the 60th parallel you'll be stopped by the military and turned around under threat of being sunk or jailed um we don't control our destiny on this realm and they're hiding god i'm convinced and once you realize god by his creation uh i'm positive that we'll have a realization that we are special and that our ideas have power and that we co-create this existence with god and that is the theme that is getting views on the interwebs and then you learn that every town has courthouses and churches uh with mysterious architecture that might predate our modern civilization and there's evidence of worldwide mud floods um, Stu Peters does a great job of covering these issues with great documentaries. Um, so people on the edge looking for truth are looking at this stuff that I'm talking about now. And it's a glorious time to be alive as we discover what these cathedrals really were. Why, what were these uh, um, city, citywide, um, <coughs> uh, what do you call them, from the 1800s? Uh, these these uh, Chicago world these world fairs what were they? Um, so you know my lunch break is a wonderful YouTube channel that everyone should watch every week. Short videos looking at your town's old buildings, and it'll it'll excite you about the small towns and the cities again. You'll you'll do what I do. You know I, I go to go to Sandusky, Ohio occasionally, and I wander these old buildings and I start to investigate. Hmm. What is the true history of this amazing building? Um, so yeah, that's what my Thursday show does. Every Thursday we have great guests. Next Thursday is is going to be wonderful too. Please join us. Um, um, for whatever it's worth, where I jumped ship with our history and it really cracked my skull and the and opened it up to these. I guess you want to say forbidden knowledge or hidden knowledge suppressed. But the one that did it for me was when it had to do with the pyramids and the, one because. Pen, and I've been told that you know they were pharaoh burial grounds, and you know bought that up till this point. When somewhere along many about a decade ago, I crossed the point of why are these on exact grid points that are particular? How are they exact? I started asking questions like this: Why are they? That like you mentioned earlier, the Earth has a energy grid in and of itself, and it's well. If you were to do like Brian combine like a Tesla thing, and I don't get too conspiratorial, but like what Tesla was mentioning of this grid, which he proved, and with the notion that hey so in the con generally speaking that there's this free energy in on the planet either where would you build the plants and you're like holy crap exactly where the pyramids are now forget that pretend i didn't even say that that's already my like my skull just cracked secondly how many pharaohs have been found in these how many pyramids have we found they're all over the planet even though we don't have any record of them crossing which i want to speak of the record for a moment but we never record of them crossing or migrating and yet they're built on these exact precise points, celestial patterns, so obviously extreme mathematics. And there's only been like six, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't quantify it, but a very marginal percent of actual pharaohs found in these. So it's like, where's the evidence that these were pharaohal barrel grounds? There's very few to support it at large. And it's like, first off, you know, pyramids are beyond just, you know, the lands of pharaohs. It's like, 
So why is why are, why does this line up so exactly so precise? And you start to think, and I'll tell you where I'm at now. It's I no longer think as primitive and ancient as the same word. I do think ancient, and I don't think of them anymore when I think of an Egyptian or I think of you know civilizations. But I don't think necessarily of them as lesser than us now. I used to think that you know we're so advanced. And it's like I'm not so sure of that anymore. Um, and again, unrelated and related to this topic of this unhinged that I've had with the main narrative that we were taught um, is when I realized that most of what we cite in historical references in many in academic disciplines is based off an archaeological record. What is archaeological record? First, it's got so many gaps in it. It's, it's, it's almost laughable. And I'm not mocking archaeologists, but I do want to check their ego at the door and the archaeologists your record has got many gaps and also it only goes to the I from our ice age to here. We've got about 10,000 years of records that we can say, Hey, this went to this, to this with a high degree of, of scientific accuracy. And that's even with the gaps that I mentioned. And again, I'm not laughing at archeologists, but them framing, which is, I'm not saying they've done it. There was no conspiracy that archeologists got together and framed the narrative, but that's where it's being used always as the ultimate source of data of, the narrative we're told is based off this archaeological record. Now, if you go pre ice age, which is again, the majority of the millions and billions of years this planet has been alive, it's just called prehistory and that's nothing. It's, it's, it's just a dark, it's just a static area for us. And I'm like, so we're basing everything off of this 10,000 years of record. And the story we've been given is that's being cited as the ultimate source of hey, this is how this happened. But it's, that actually doesn't prove all the sub, the, there in the the, the t secondary and tertiary things that our narratives say that how we are here and what is what happened in the past none of that is actually supported by the archaeological record dr reggie just says hey this was here at this time and through a lot of scientific the way that those things are dated and it's like a lot of that's now being called into question under other than archaeologists in fact there are some few i guess you say pioneer archaeologists that are saying hey we don't know what we're talking about even when we're dating it's like our dating method. We can only date like we cannot, we can only date organic matter. It's like, so sure, a leaf may have failed and fossilized, but that has no actual correlation to the pyramid it was next to. But we're dating it based on the organic matter. We can't date concrete or rock. And it's like, holy crap. Well, then why are they telling me it's X or Y? It's like, again, mind just unraveling. Um, I, I, I know that we, we do have both have to go, but I do want to ask, you know, I want to kind of get looking ahead. Um, you know, you mean, and, and where do you see the future of health freedom heading, especially with increasing government involvement in healthcare among and the many issues that we've discussed? Well, it depends if Trump wins and keeps his promise to hire RFK to run a chronic disease commission that will uproot the corporate control of the bureaucracies behind the real epidemic of chronic disease. Um, if that happens and RFK is successful, that's a shortcut to victory. Um, assuming that may not happen because of the usual voting fraud uh, or the ignorance and brainwashing of the American people and uh, the cackling hyena wins who has promised to censor us, um, then it's going to be a longer haul because uh, her tribe doesn't care about health freedom, um, except for pesticides. I mean, Democrats give lip service to re-regulating some pesticides put on our crops um but um and then some of them are helpful with the wireless issue and being fine with a lot of taxpayer subsidies for fiber or cable connections to your house uh so in some marginal areas they might be helpful uh, but in most areas they're not and with their being puppets of the global controllers that want to control us and coerce us and hurt us and make us good uh, robot slaves for their new world order. Uh, I think it's gonna be difficult. Um, but meanwhile, we have to work on ourselves. So, you know, I teach Kundalini yoga. Uh, I think everyone should do yoga and meditate, walk in the woods, ground, keep getting healthy, and uh, make these local connections with your local farmers, village markets, online communities, gig work, um, you know, your startup friends and do what we can to uh, build a parallel economy uh, and build and glorify uh, the creator's creation in our own way, despite whatever these global demons want to do. Here's a startup uh, you and I should work together and aggregating. There's a centralized platform of like, 
taking like a freedom hub plus the actionable where a startup could come to for funding it's in this vein or if somebody was looking to get it how to find their like an aggregate platform now i'm not trying to under, give us both homework because that is a massive undertaking but that would be a worthwhile venture that those like us and we're not alone um i would gravitate towards i know i would i'm speaking for myself and i know that i represent a certain type of audience yeah, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there working on this community angle for the awakened and mm -hmm. the innovative. I like that phrasing. I really like that phrasing. I don't know if it's my ego that likes it or if it's an objective like it, but I like that to say the awakened. I like that. Yeah, there's a lot of us. Um, you know, the people that think for themselves. Yes. People that I that I characterize as what we call Americans, because uh, I don't think you can really be an American if you're not American. And uh, I'm sorry for the cohort of people that love coercion and, and authority figures but you're not an american in my book uh you're a brain actually you're not basing it off of geographical birth you're basing it off of the foundational ideals that's a novel idea and it's beautiful it's a, you, you that's we started in rebellion <laughs> you have to have some critical thought for yourself and that's how you're tying the debt. And I, 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 I'm, by the way, I'm gonna steal that, Charles. I may cite you. I may not. I'm, the definition of American is, and quote, the ideals, not well. Where were you born? Alone. Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm just saying I like the distinction over variable. Yeah, and um, you know Montesquieu, the separation of powers. We can experiment on what American means in the in the fifty states, um, and uh, you know I think that's how we're structured so that we can make mistakes on a smaller scale in the states versus a federal solution that's going to hurt all right. of us um but yeah i think we need to be a bit more aggressive on insisting uh what our america experiment is and we should insist on the libertarian uh version which is do whatever you want as long as you're not, you're not harming others and if you do harm others you're going to face justice what role do you think digital platforms like podcasts and alternative media will play in shaping public opinion uh, about health care and freedom and moving forward to, to build the, the, the freedom America that you and I both share? I think a huge role because, you know, before construction, you have to destruct. Uh, and, I, and I think it is the times that we're destroying the global infrastructure in a helpful loving way don't worry folks and out of the ashes uh instead of their great reset we're having the great awakening and uh people are seeing that as per oprah's town hall with kamala yesterday she uh platformed several hollywood bigwigs uh in in that and a lot of people on twitter are going who cares what ben stiller and chris rock had to say about Kamala's answering or not answering of questions. Uh, and especially the CNN and ABC have failed over the past several years. Um, who takes up the mantle of information? Um, Elon is, is supporting X. People on X are having great vigorous debates with all kinds of unpopular speech and, and it's glorious. Tucker Carlson, Robert F. Kennedy, you know, <laughs> game changing uh dynamic now with trump um but it's, it, it might be you and me and our, on our podcasts that uh bring out the truth joe rogan has a great podcast but a lot of folks don't watch him anymore because he's often fairly tame um you know there are new people jim brewer the comedian uh there are x spaces on x x spaces where more controversial people are just arbitrarily starting a conversation on x where you can talk to these people who are edgy it's a wonderful brave new world uh where people like you and me are daring to put our voices out there in the public sphere and maybe maybe people will, will follow us you know or freedom hub or the the hustler uh what's the full name of your podcast the full-time hustler but hustler is the main thing yeah full-time hustler um who knows who's gonna take the lead on, on the great awakening i think you and i are gonna have a part of it because people love um angel investors because everyone everyone wants to do a startup but they're scared and ignorant uh and lack confidence 
Um, so I think those of us who can lead a bunch of small companies are going to lead because people want to get out of the cubicle. Uh, they want to work for doing, they want to make money doing good, you know, conscious capitalism. Um, they want to have local community ventures and apps. So it's, it's kind of a, kind of a wild west and that's kind of fun. Uh, turning into what you're turning into to your point here, there is one article that I have read. This was in 2020, I believe I wrote it. Yes, December on my blog, which is attached to this podcast. And the title is Observing America's Chaotic and Perfect Union Walmart. At the time, I wasn't as good at clickbait, so my title's not as catchy as I see that I, someone in your camp really is in these titles of your videos. And then, and you, it's really important, like knowing copyright and how to like do title because writing the way I write, which I'm a writer, if I've been told. But that's more for the like this article itself versus like short condensed that's a con different type of writing but what i'm bringing up is this in this article i'm standing as you see at the garden center this is 2020 uh my my the person i was with went down the aisle to get more lights because i was in a competition with my neighbor to have the most decorated house so she's down i couldn't fit down the aisle so i'm standing right here at the edge of the garden center and i and, I, and First, let me ask, can you see my screen where I'm standing here um, um, at Walmart? Um, yeah. So this article, I go on to say that, you know, and I open up with America. It's been said that America's dividing. We're at war with ourselves. But what I point out in this article, standing right here for five minutes, enough for the um, uh, partner I was with to go down to the into the garden center where they had converted for more for the lights, for the Christmas lights. Um, I saw black, green, yellow, black, brownish, tannish. I saw fat, skinny. I saw people that look rich, look poor. I like people that look poor, that felt rich. I've heard people, people in conversation going by. All dynamics. Every And I'm talking about standing there for only five minutes. And what hit me and so vividly in that moment is it's our diversity. It's, it's the, in fact, I'll get to the punchline and come back. But it's the further we go, I want the left to go further and the right to go further because what happens is the middle gets bigger. That's the, that's the point. But it's the, People think that because someone argues with them and, and what references is your, the Twitter and the dialogues that happen, and they are so vigorous, and people assume that that means America is divided. No. When I stood there and really my exhibit A evidence to this article is, is anybody fighting anybody like physical? Physical? Let's go. Let's assume libertarian principles, which are only two that are in my standard, you know, don't physically harm someone and don't take their stuff. Are any of those being broken? No. So we're not divided. America's flexing. It has, if someone travels internationally, one of the first things they will experience, and I highly recommend people to travel internationally or just travel in general, but also travel internationally. What thing you're going to notice is group think in a more marginalized way than we have. We think of it as Americans. Generally, we think that if someone argues us so vigorously, we mistake their residents of the argument as again, we're divided as a collective. See, no, go somewhere else and see if you could even have that debate. And you go many places that are, and I won't even, you don't even have to go to the Chinas or the Russians. Go any, and even in your, that area you're in will think only one way. Generally speaking, I, this is not a hard law, but it is just a general observation on many places that there isn't the diversity of even thought, much less discussion in areas outside of the America, which is like when we have these debates and we're screaming at each other, that's the beauty of it. One person's crying, one person's laughing, one person feels dumb. It's one person doesn't get, that's America flexing. The diversity, the, 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 the vividness, the, the depth and the resonance that we, we speak from in each position, but it's the, America's not divided. It's flexing. It's the, have these arguments and again and you, and you really appreciate do we even have it and we have platforms like yours and specifically rumble and i'm glad you're on it and substack where people can say these things because in a lot of areas you don't even have that you don't even have the basics the foundation for them to write or speak on much less actually have the diversity of thought which america so clearly has that again in my experiments being taken my impromptu experiment was taken from walmart standing i mean everybody i saw i couldn't even it would have been harder to calculate, to document the diversity of who, I, of who I'm surrounded by. I mean, other than the generalized, like probably race, you know, there wasn't, I mean, everything would probably just had one check mark in it. And I'd say there was total 50 people that passed in that five minutes. 
there was 50 different categories none of them had two it, it, and that's the beauty and i love the love that the platforms like x and i just want an only reason i'm bringing this up i mean obviously minus a plug for my own platform i guess um which is not really the point but it's to show that these diversity of like your X's are not to be, don't mistake the argument as a weakness. The argument is a strength and that especially comes true when you do travel. And I'm, for those that haven't, that um, uh, I'm, that's unfortunate. And I hope that that becomes a plan because, and if you do travel again, the fact that we talk the way we talk, the fact that you and I, you and I are not alone and you and I know that, even though of course, a lot of other positions may want to frame it that way. They want to belittle that's law 101 is take away the argument you know belittle the foundation of the person that you're speaking that you're debating i don't think they could have much evidence in that because again you and i know we're not alone and really what i'm pointing out is there's it's way larger in america than anywhere else it's kind of the last stand if you will on this especially under the theme we're under under you know freedom of speech under freedom of thought freedom you know think for yourself no matter how outlier it may be but no matter how um, there was a phrase you used that I have to go back and, and coin. I'm going to get it and transfer it, but you, you phrased them as I'm, I'm edgy. I like that. I like that term. Um, edgy. The, it, it's, we have much more of that here than anywhere else. And that's what I just want to, again, to the listener, that's a strength, not a weakness. Even if you allegedly, and I'm just going to take a cliche answer here and I'll, I'll stop talking, but, uh, you know, the left and the right kind of dialogue, which is the general one we'll see, the left is screaming at the right and the right is screaming at the right, whatever, the, whichever side the listener is on, they know what it's like to feel that other side. No matter how much you may hate or hate it, nothing actually happens. You're not going to go shoot. Like, there's no war. Like, we're not actually shooting each other over politics. We may say, well, we may talk a lot of those things, but I will also tell you as a war combat veteran, talking about war and actually being there are completely two different things. And it's kind of rhetorical to even point out. And also, the depth of what I'm saying is only known by usually those that have studied history or those that have fought it. Because, again, war by a veteran, I will also be very clear in saying war, I don't wish on my enemy. So when you, you know, when a left and a, and a right dialogue is talking, they may reference, oh, you know, can't, you, screw that other side. They should just die. It's like, that's easy to say. And you should be able to say it. But also, I do want to draw the, the acute, saying something is not the verb that it's describing. I can talk about running. That doesn't make me a runner. You know, I can talk about hating someone or shooting someone, but that doesn't mean I've actually committed that crime. I haven't taken this. I haven't broken the two cardinal rules by my standard of the libertarianism. Or, and this is more than that. I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, but I do that oversimplification because one, it's accurate of the libertarian definition and only two rules because people get it. And usually I'm talking to someone that's not libertarian and I'm trying to explain what it is. And I do it in such a simplicity that I see the eyeballs click and I see the resonance. And most of the people I'm speaking to, I also reference you are, you know, you live your life libertarian because I'm an outlier thinker myself and you have no problem being my friend and you know, I, and I'm out and I'm openly, I speak against the two platforms and you still set me. So as a verb, you live libertarian, which usually helps people accept the idea a little bit easier when they see that well, I'm not talking voting booth. I'm talking as a life, you're living liberty. My street lives libertarian. I've got multiple people in my street, multiple diversities. But everybody stays in their yard unless invited. Like nobody's vandalizing somebody else's house. Nobody's, and everybody stops at the mailbox, doesn't come in the driveway unless invited. It's like we're living libertarian. We just, and converting the public to the, the ballot box, that's a different issue that you obviously you and I face. Um, I'm sorry, that little, little, I'll stop sharing. Um, I just want to reference that, that the diversity of our thought is a strength and it is something, it is tangible especially when you travel internationally, because that thought is not there. Um, I have a moment to, if you got any comments on that, if not, I have two more questions that we can close up. Um, well, as Churchill said, and, and I'm not really a fan of him, um, we're the worst form of gov gov government except for all the others. So I'm, yeah. That's beautifully put. And again, it doesn't mean it doesn't cite the whole man, but I love that quote. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have we have um, an arena that allows for more diversity in, in arguments, but it has been under threat, especially as experienced during COVID, when anyone trying to say anything useful was censored uh, or fired or worse. Um, and you know, it's under threat because you know Kamala and her and her VP from Minnesota both support censorship and their friend governor Newscom uh, passed a law 
uh, threatening fines in a cage for anyone that produces an AI generated uh, political ad, which is too bad because they're very hilarious. <laughs> the gene, genius, geniuses behind these uh, fake ads do great content. There is truth um, in jest. Yeah, but it's obviously parody. Uh, and uh, I think that was part of the uh, Larry Flint case that if it's obviously parody, uh, you know, you can't you can't censor it. Um, but go ahead, your question. Matt, I actually have one question. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs? And this is really to my specific, my largest audience and gen of all platforms combined. Uh, and my and this is specific. And this is a feed of my LinkedIn network, my fa my Facebook network and my ex Twitter network. Uh, and I'm speaking of looking at the data. Uh, I like behind the scenes and seeing data. All three of those feed into what I call my network. And of that network, the largest three groups, this will be no surprise to you. Um, in fact, you're in one of them, in fact, you're in two, uh, are uh, entrepreneurs. And that's make should be uh, make sense. And that that's what I proactively actively spend the most time um, advocating. So, you know, entrepreneurial minded entrepreneur, you know, hustle, gig work, economy, creator, economy, all those, those are the largest network or the largest group within my network. Second is libertarian, libertarian thought, libertarian, or we'll say even edgy or those of the left and right, more so right in my probably 80, 20 right, left percentage of those that are becoming disenfranchised or consciously aware of being disenfranchised by or their representation of what they thought was the left and right uh, or their party respectively. Um, and therefore looking for, you know, asking questions that bring them to someone like me digitally uh, through SEO and all that. And then my third audience uh, would be veterans at large with a high percentage of Marines for, again, obvious reasons. Uh, Marines will resonate with other Marines and veterans will respect other veterans at a generalized sense. And again, those are my three largest networks. So this last question is framed. I'm speaking directly to those networks. Again, the largest being entrepreneurial minded, the second being uh, libertarian circles and specific. It's it's usually specific, it's again about 80 percent specific libertarian circles. And then that 20 percent is those that are on the edge of, you know, they're becoming disenfranchised or aware of their disenfranchisement. And then the last one being a uh, veteran circle. So what advice would you give to entrepreneurs or activists and specifically those that are really listening to this audience who are passionate about health freedom and the issues that we've discussed and want to make a tangible impact in this space? So again, what advice do you have for them, for the listener as a last action? Um, so for those three cohorts and everyone in general, number one, work on yourself and you'll get good advice from friends and experts on what that working should comprise. Uh, I'm partial to Kundalini yoga in which I'm certified to teach. I believe it's variety of workouts makes it less boring than your usual gym yoga. That's a series of poses. I'm not knocking those poses. They're wonderful. They're tried and true. They come from a long lineage of a thousand years or more, they work. Um, but there's other styles and the style that I teach has just a lot more variety. So I like variety. And the meditations that we teach also are, have more variety, whether it's a focus, a hand position, a chant, a mantra, a visualization. So it's not just sitting still and breathing, uh, which sounds kind of boring and I think prevents a lot of folks from even trying it because it's too boring in today's fast age. Um, so that's the first recommendation, whether you're uh, a, a hustler, uh, a contrarian, uh, or a veteran uh, defending our shores uh, as working yourself, and I'm partial to the yoga that I teach. Number two, uh, I think everyone should try to be an entrepreneur because you're comfy, a cubicle job is going to end with the natural flows of a market economy. So diversify, uh, try and find a gig that you enjoy, preferably. Um, I have that luxury, whether I'm upgrading folks from network limited Obamacare to sharing or lobbying to free us from the worst epidemic there is, chronic disease. 
Um, but Jason, if anyone, probably has lots of ideas for gig work. Um, and you know, you could do it as a digital nomad if you take Jason's advice to travel. There are places around the world that are pretty uh, safe and conducive to uh, gig work as a digital nomad. So don't limit yourself just to the U.S. Although if you do, if you do remain here, please help us fix this place. Um, for the contrarians and libertarians, um, use gig work to change the world. Uh, when I upgrade people into cash patients, I'm changing the world because healthcare uh, it takes a fifth of the economy because it's a top-down uh, oligarchy. And as we undercut all the mainstream incumbents in this market, we're going to make a lot of money for a lot of small gig workers who are pressuring the system with things that actually meet the customer demand. And for veterans, uh, please know that uh, I personally know doctors who are prescribing grounding to you, which includes visits to parks, something you no longer will be able to do if Congress passes the parks bill uh, with the wireless provisions that, that are going to carpet our our parks and wilderness areas with antennas that are going to injure you. Um, veterans increasingly are prescribed visits to parks for stress reduction, healing, and post-traumatic stress reduction. Um, so um, please care about that issue. Also, you have been guinea pigs for pharma for decades, more so now than ever. Um, your chronic disease probably results from uh, your forced participation in experimental pharma medications and vaccines. So please join our health freedom movement to protect your brothers who are going through basic training now so that they can be ready for combat. Um, they are not ready for combat now because they are chronically diseased and made worse so during um, uh, their entry into your service because of all the vaccines and other pharma products. So please care about this very serious threat to readiness. Before I close, are there any final remarks that we have not discussed that you would like to address the audience? Um, well, look for the materials in the information by this recording for how you can upgrade to become a cash patient. It's important that you do so because uh, chronic disease is exploding and you need to, to protect yourself so you can go to the, doc to the doctor you want to go to. Uh, otherwise, you'll be limited. Um, the globalists are, want us sick and robotic and dumbed down. Uh, so you need to uh, help us in the health freedom cause. Um, please support Jason and his his wonderful uh, uh a, a drive to help the entrepreneurs because only entrepreneurship can save us. Um, I thank you, Jason, for this opportunity and, and connection and experience and conversation. Wow. What an enlightening conversation. And Charles, I want to thank you again for joining us today and sharing your incredible insights on health freedom, your journey as a lobbyist, and the groundbreaking work you're doing with Freedom Hub. Your passion for making the world a better place truly shines through. And I know our listeners got a lot out of it. And I know I did personally. For everyone tuning in, if you want to stay up to date with Charles, work and hear more from the amazing entrepreneurs and advocates he features, be sure to follow his podcast, Freedom Hub, over on Rumble. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. And while you're at it, connect with Charles on LinkedIn. He's got a wealth of knowledge to share, and it's a great way to follow his latest activities. That wraps up today's episode of Full-Time Hustler. If you've enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a review, and share it with anyone who needs a little inspiration on how to take control of their health and freedom. Until next time, keep hustling, and as always, take care of yourselves out there.